Cedric Maxwell podcast is powered by Price Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. Another episode of the Cedric Maxwell podcast. I am Josue Pavone alongside Cedric Maxwell. And fellas, we told you we're going to have some great guests. We got, we got one right here. Very special guest, Grant Williams, uh, NBA veteran, former Celtic, Charlotte Hornet, big man joining the show, man, during his offseason. What's going on, Grant? Appreciate you stopping by. Thanks for having me on. Happy to be here. Heard something about your voice. Tell us, you, you, you were, your, your vocals weren't right. We were gonna yeah, we had to postpone this. Tell, right. tell us what happened, man. Because I'm like, my, what's wrong with my boy's voice? I, if, if anybody, if it hurt anybody not to talk, it had to be you. <laughs> yeah, just say it was like a whole week and a half, two weeks where I really just either didn't have a voice or I was raspy. So um, it was interesting dealing with that. You know, I mean, I did, it wasn't even from season. That's the crazy part. Like I was yelling as much as I could during the year, but then all of a sudden my voice goes away when I start the off season. It's crazy, but um, happy to have it back. And, you know, hopefully people are happy to hear it again. Well, tell us a little bit about your Charlotte team before we talk about your former team and all these other things, because uh, just tell us what you're doing right now and how they're doing. Well, I, what I'm doing is what you see. I'm sitting here watching games, but outside of that, uh, golfing and just, you know, enjoying the off season as much as I can. But at the same time, um, getting prepared. You know, our team's young, um, has a lot of great potential. Um, I feel like um, no one really expects much of us, which is part of the good thing because uh, we have the talent to be able to do do a lot of uh, um, special things next year, whether it's winning games, but also making playoffs and just ma- making an impact on each other, you know, as we continue to grow. Um, whether Whatever draft pick we add this upcoming offseason, and then on top of that, the veterans that we'll continue to bring back and hopefully whoever we sign, hopefully we get Miles back. And um, it's just a good opportunity for us to really make a lot of great things happen. Just the way he, this this man's a veteran. He he, he talks like a veteran. He's, his yeah, words he are measured. All this stuff. Now I want to get to the knitting, the 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 the, the down dirty stuff because both <laughs> your former teams are playing right now. How, how do you feel about that? You look at Dallas. Dallas gave you this money. Then they, they all of a sudden decided that you know this doesn't fit. How did that? How did that? You know, rang out with you in the first place. Yeah, uh, for me, it was one of those where I, w- I didn't take anything from it. Like, they gave me an opportunity to um, make the money that I am making now, but also have an opportunity to make a uh, name or even position myself for the team that I'm on currently. Um, I'm excited for the opportunity here in Charlotte, but when it comes to Dallas, like, I'm excited for those guys. You know, they, they look good and competing against the Clippers. Um, I'm excited for my man, D. Jones. I just want to give a big shout-out to him because not only is this a tremendous human, tremendous human being, but – a uh, great teammate and a person that plays incredibly hard. Um, one of the best defenders in the league in my eyes. But um, and then Luca and Kai have been special as they always been. Just way before you uh, ask your question, I gotta get to this because this is crazy. When did you it's become a, a, a bad guy? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I was all of a sudden I see Mike Gorman talking about you. I see people from Dallas in the background talking about you. And the guy that I've always known and the guy that I love is a friend and a you know I. You didn't have any of this. So where did all this crap come from about you? I have no idea. Honestly, it's one of those where I think when uh, narrative is created, people pick up, like, jump on it. So I think after the uh, trade and everything else that got leaked from whatever else, I don't know who leaked, like, whether it was Tim Legler or stuff like that, saying people didn't like me there, I don't know what it was. But uh, it started it. And then I guess when Draymond, and, well, while, while I was there in Dallas, I remember Draymond and, B- B- and Book were talking about how I was being a tough guy and all this other stuff. But I've always been a guy that protects and helps my teammates whenever possible. So I never go into a game saying I'm going to try to fight nobody. So it's really interesting just hearing all those different narratives. And you just try your best to be the, take the high road and move past them because I really appreciate each and every player that I play with, every, every player that I've come across you know I, I love to compete i'm a natural competitor and sometimes your competitive instincts getting the best of you but at the same time um that the whole bad guy narrative no idea and then Gorman, well, wait, well look wait a minute hold on you were rubbing heads with jimmy butler yeah i mean this is my boy i'm i'm, I'm sticking with you thick and thin but you did yeah. have a couple of beasts with some people and it was it was right in front of our eyes. You know what's right. funny? It's funny because I never, if you know me, Max, I'm not the first type to talk first, you know? So, like, it's like if you look at a Jimmy story, uh, I always tell it on the time. I'm like, Jimmy, when, he, when I shot the three right before that play happened and one happened, uh, I remember he said, like, hell no, that 
ain't here. And so <laughs> made the three. I said, I'm here. I'm here. Like, I'm, kind of, like, I'm making it because I have a good game and stuff like that. And then he made the shot. He said, I'm here too. And just started screaming it. And we were just, I don't remember what we said. It was just like that blackout moment. But like, I'm never a type to back down for me level of competition. Um, I enjoy, like, I'm the, I'm the type of person that, like, I want to compete against you no matter how you like to compete. Whether it's you talking trash, and then I talk. But if you don't talk, right. like Giannis is the Joel B never talks trash. Like, well, that I, at least not to me. But, um, you know, like, those guys, like, they just get the, the work in. And I love those type of players, whether it's, like, no matter where we are, no matter what game we're playing, um, I'm ready to compete at the highest level, and we're going to battle. And that's what I enjoy. I love, I love the battle. I love the war. And some nights you're going to lose and other nights you're going to win. So I always try to keep my head high through it. And when I lose, I admit that I got my ass kicked. And then when I win, I'm, I'm expect to be here the same. You know, I'm, I'm glad you guys brought this up because one of the biggest quotes that stood out to me after game five was what Jason Tatum talked about when he asked, well, who who decides what tough is, right? Toughness. I mean, everyone has their own sort of definition in a sense, right? It doesn't always have to be, oh, the loudest guy in the room or or the guy who's maybe a quiet leader. You know, there's, there's different forms of toughness. So when guys want to change the narrative, it sort of depends on who's – who speaking on it right like who defines that you know like yeah in the spirit of the moment like you just said you and jimmy butler going at it or whatever like yeah you're gonna talk your itch because you're in the you're competing you know and i thought that that was one of the great moments of that series because it, it was like man when when the Suns were down whole three it's like someone needs to start showing some of that showing some hey we're not gonna get pushed around here and i thought that you really were the guy that sort of changed that you know throughout that series and then of course the comeback obviously fell short in game seven but man to force a game seven it takes a lot of toughness and a lot of grit to get, you know, back into the series the way you guys did. Absolutely. Like I always respect those heat teams because like I always say when you define tough, you have to think of the guys who do it consistently. Like you can see this where little magic teams get in there. Like they're a team that people would say is and breeds toughness, you know, like same with Tibbs teams in New York. Like those guys are tough no matter if they're fighting you or if they're just playing hard. Right. And Miami is a team that like, like me and Bam always talk just because we've known each other since we were 15, 16 years old. So, like, I'm, I say he thinks I'm complimenting or not complimenting him. There was one play, I think, where he hit a little shimmy fade, and I said, okay, you've been working on your game. And he said, he, like, cursed me out. But I was like, <laughs> I'll just give you a compliment. My bad. But, like, uh, those teams, like, they play hard, man, and you got to love it. you got to step into it. Like, no matter – you'll see a lot of these mo playoff moments that are going to happen um, where – a team's going to try and put an impact. Like you saw in not only just the Miami Heat-Boston series, Bam ran through Al's chest in game four, you know? Mm -hmm. you see whether it's the Mavs Clippers series, you know, where PJ, you know, gets going, gets the crowd going, and gets the team going. It, it sparks some level of toughness because if you look over each series, like I remember game one watching the Mavs series, Clips came out on some, like, we're going to bully you guys. And then that series, next game, they responded. So um, that's the love of the playoffs for me is uh, something I miss and wish I was in right now. But um, that level of competitive edge, that level of understanding that winning is priority, no matter how it looks, no matter how ugly it gets. Um, and I think that's the identity of toughness. You know, you can be a guy that wants to find everybody, but, you know, it's a level of insecurity. So I always say that being tough doesn't necessarily be defined by, uh, being the loudest in the room or being a guy that walks around saying no one's going to mess with me unless you're James Johnson because James Johnson kill it, kill one. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I always say that. There's certain guys you don't fuck with. And, and, and you fuck. That dude right there, uh -uh, he ain't the one. Yo, his name came up in this podcast before. Fight, but that dude, nah, I ain't fuck with him. He's the one. Listen, listen. Oh, you know, man. you know, I used to say, like, if you get into a fight at school and you lose, you better fight again and keep fighting until, like, and you keep coming back. Oh, heading back, yeah. One of those guys where I say, Ma, I'm going to need some help. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it must have been pretty cool when because you know, Max brought up the, the the Mike Gorman comment about you weren't the best teammate, and but Jason Tatum just goes out on Twitter and just says pretty much like, "Hey, that's cap." You know, like what was that like? You know, to, to hear to see rather Jason Tatum speak up and um, just sort of set the record straight. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, man, that was special. I um, remember um, when he did that. I, I didn't ask him to do that, and I just sent him a text afterwards like, "I appreciate you." Like um, that's like something that goes unnoticed sometimes and I appreciate him. D White, I think, spoke up about it as well. And like I, I still keep in contact with my teammates from my rookie season. Like I talk to Carson and Taco and guys like that. I reach I try to reach out to everybody because, you know, like we're all brothers at the end of the day. And yeah. um, 
as players, you know, it's a difficult thing sometimes. You may not have the closest relationship, but there might be a level of respect. And there's other guys that you're going to have close relationships with, and they're going to um, be the ones that you maybe invite to your wedding one day and stuff like that. But being a bad teammate is something that I never want to be, be called or labeled because I try my best to be there for my teammates in whatever capacity possible. And yeah, sometimes I will acknowledge that I get annoying or get some level of like, like some shut up grant, like we got to just focus on this. And I accept that because I know my personality and my goofiness is not for everybody. And I always, I remember Tice, this is the perfect example. Tice hated me. I think when I first got, got to Boston, he <laughs> said, damn it. He always would tell me to shut up and stuff like that. And then we went to a couple of dinners and then he gets started getting comfortable around me. Now he's one of my closest friends. But like uh, I always tease him. I'm like, I remember back in the day, man, you used to treat me wrong as a rookie. It wasn't even because I was a rookie. And he was like, he was like, Yeah, I couldn't stand you, but not <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the thing about the it's NBA, and I, I want to ask you this. Um, comparing two players. Because you play with two great players. Now you see Jason Tatum, and then you see what you have with Luca. Uh, how different are those two players, and, and, and what are their games like since you've seen them up close and personal? It's actually very interesting because someone asked me this the other day. Um, in terms of their, their ability, like – the, the level of impact they both have on the game is, is incredible and special. You know, I, I haven't had the opportunity to see JT on his own, like by himself with no other, like necessarily like where Luca's just Kyrie's down, a couple guys down, the other secondary score maker, playmakers. I remember when JB went down, that's when I saw JT in that net series. And I remember he had 61, like people act like he doesn't have that, but JT's ability to defend, defend and then impact the game offensively, not just by his scoring, but by his playmaking is is something special because he trusts his teammates and it's something that he's had to learn and develop. Luca, I think he's at a position right now where he knows that he can carry a team and I think he's going to develop that where it's like, okay, I can carry but at the same time like last night. You saw how he was getting off the ball, going playing faster and stuff like that. And I think as he develops that continues similar to how JT did, like it's going to be special. He's going to be special to watch. He's already one I think he's like him and him JT Jokic and who's the fourth Giannis you could say are like four of the top best players in the league. You could argue your case for each one. And each one's different, but I think that, like, it's special to be on the teams with those two. Luka slows the game down, can make way – I think he makes more difficult shots than Tatum um, just in terms of the shots that he's able to take and the the footwork and his pace and stuff like that. How the hell does that man get his shot off? It looks slow motion. I'm, like, looking at it. You can see it coming. <laughs> like, I want you. I want. I want to say this. Said he's gonna be the one that you know. You guys talk about Larry Bird and how cold he was back in the day and stuff like that. He's gonna be that. Mm-hmm. Like he, no one's gonna believe how good Luca was. No one's gonna believe like, oh, how is he doing this at this pace? Like you guys just weren't athletic enough or guard him. Oh, this, no, this this guy is special. And like it's, I'm excited to see who fought fights between the faces of the league between him, uh, JD, and Anthony Edwards over the next five, ten years. And then when Victor becomes Victor, like when he is in the conversation. But like, man, I, I was around that man in practice every day, day to day, and he's a phenomenal um, player. But he's also like, I think people always talk about Luca as if like he's not this good guy. Like he's he's amazing. Like he's a good dude, and he's a person that. You could also always say like he wants to compete, he wants to win, and sometimes it may look like he's whining or complaining, but at the same time, like that's just a level of passion. And sometimes it may look different compared to pe- pe- person by person. And um, I'm thankful to be able to say I played with both of those two guys in my career. And um, who, who knows, I must be able to say the same hopefully about Lamelo and Brandon Miller as they continue to develop. You see, I, you see, I did that, Joe Sway. Say, turn that page. Yeah, that's how you do it, man. That's a veteran. That's some good shit right there. <laughs> that right back to his team. That, that, that's, that's pretty good, young man. You've learned a lot. The episode of the Cedric Maxwell podcast is powered by Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less and two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Get in on the playoff action and win up to 100 times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what makes prize picks the number one sports app. This week on prize picks, I'm selecting Derek White for more than 4.5 assists and Chris Porzingis for more than 8.5 rebounds. 
It's that easy. Download the app today and use the code CLNS for a first deposit up to $100. That's CLNS for a first deposit up to $100. Download Prize Picks today and make sure you use the promo code CLNS. The thing that I really thought was so cool about meeting you the first time is that you, you're you not afraid. You're not afraid to instill yourself into people. The first time I ever met you, I remember you coming sitting beside me on the plane. You always remember that. And you talking to me. I was like, damn, that's for a young player. Normally that doesn't happen. Did that come from your mom? You know, because she is so in your dad. And are those people the people that influence you to be more talkative and you know, just let your personality flow. Yeah, I would say my dad got me for the social aspect, being able to walk up to anybody and, and say hello and introduce yourself and talk. Like, he, I remember there was a story about the big three where my friend was the biggest fan of Ice Cube and Run Our Test and a couple others. And he's the shyest guy you can ever, ever know. And my dad was like, man, come on. And he, like, walks us over. He's like, this is Kyle. This is Grant. Blah, blah, blah. This is my kid. Like, and every like I just got it from him, like being able to say, like, what's the worst that could happen? Someone to say it's go away or, you know, shut up or something like that. Yeah, you got to get used to rejection. So um, that's where I got it from the social aspect. For my mom, I feel like that's where I got my curiosity. And I think that's why some people will always say, like, he's a know-it-all or wants to, wants to know it all at least. Because, like, I was, she told me back in the day, like, there's always seven solutions or more to an, to an equation or problem. Dang. So. You have to look like I don't want you to just give me one. I want you to give me all of them. So like that's why I always ask people why. It's because it's not because I'm questioning or trying to be argumentative because I'm curious. Like I want to know how they got to the answer. Like how like I can view it from a different perspective. And um, I think that can rub people the wrong way sometimes. But at the same time, like I always assume that I, I do it from the, the good place of my heart. I never want to do it from a con contentious like I put a diminishing way, but um, that's, those are the two people that I kind of learned my life from. And I try and tell people to live the same way because when it comes to the social aspect, like you never know who you'll meet one day. You'll never know yeah. when I will arise. You never know what connections and friends you can make that might be lifelong. And then from the other perspective, you never know what you could learn. Like you never know, like what coach can teach you something that you have never expected or that, you know what, Grant, that's, that's different from a, a mother of color. Okay, like just yeah. wait, mom. Just wait. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine your mom asking you asking you stuff, and you going why? And then oh, why? Man. <laughs> my mom would got one. Two, oh, three, you, had, you had about one, yeah, one good yeah. why. And that's it. Yeah. And, my dad, my... and my dad, there was no time. There was no why. It's just like I told you to go out there. I know it's 150 degrees right now, and but you go out there and cut that grass. I wish yeah. I would have turned around and said, "Hey, why?" No, no, no. The What's best is the best is why, and then what you just say? Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. It's done. I'm gonna get it done. All right, Dad. My bad. You that's right. my, grandma, my grandma, my grandpa, man. That was it. Like I learned. That's how I learned how to shut up too. Like, <laughs> that's, why, that's why my mom said that she. The reason why she raised me that way. She's. I don't want to beat my children. I don't want to be the person that like makes an impact on you. And I was like, sheesh. My grandma did as much as you. You. You said you wouldn't. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now, how well, hold on, hold on, Max. I gotta ask this question real quick. When did you, uh, when when did you start playing basketball? When did you fall for the game, so to speak? Was it a social thing? Did you like how did the game come into your life? And when did you realize, like, man, I can, you know what, this is this is my future. Yeah, I'm, I came from a basketball family, so like in a way, like I was a kid that honestly was just a lazy kid that just like was didn't really know much. Was just enjoy basketball because it gave me the chance to meet friends and stuff like that at mm -hmm. first. Um, my cousin, Salim Stardemeyer, Damon, those guys, that's the reason why, like, I have some type of connection from my dad's side. And then I remember, like, I remember I fell in love with it really going into my, like, high school season because I'm a, I, before I just loved the competitiveness of basketball. I enjoyed the socialness of basketball because I was a shy kid. I was a guy that was insecure. I was a nerd. So it wasn't, like, something that, something that made me cool. And then eventually I was like, dang, like, I love this sport. I love being in the gym. I love working out. Like, I enjoy, and I'm getting, like, you, sometimes you may lose that love. And I feel like that's something you, you find, again, you know, when it comes to profession, to turning it back to your, your love and passion. And um, I, I remember that was in high school that I remember that I was like, you know what? Like, I love this game, and I want to see what the most I can do out of it. And I want to continue to improve and get better and no matter what people say or do around me i'm gonna make the most out of the opportunities that i receive 
Now I gotta ask you this question. When did Kyrie Irving become the love bug now again? Because he's gone from, you know, villain. Nobody likes him. Get out of this team. And now you see a whole nother side. He's gotten to Dallas, and they've just embraced him. And he seems like he's in I'm, I'm, this growth pattern. I mean, you, you're you there with him. You play with him. But how, how has that changed? That just seems really kind of cool. It's really cool for me to see that come for him. I feel like it's a level of growth from every person, but at the same time, it's all—it's always narrative and spin. You know, same way they talked about Russell Westbrook being, quote, the worst player and talked out of his name. He was in L.A., and then he goes to the Clippers, and you're like, oh, like, he's an impact player. Like, And it changed the narrative and the conversation around him. But, like, these guys, like, I remember Kyrie, when I first got to the league, he treated me with some of the most respect and care of any rookie, second-year, third-year player. And I'm thankful because he's he was that way when I got to Dallas, too. Like, he's a very inquisitive conversationalist person he may sometimes everybody has their swings everybody has their ups and downs whether it's I, I do too and I smile every single day but um like Kyrie's been a person that like that love bug that kind of like embracing like he always has that on teams when did the hell did he come and stomp on the leprechaun's face no here we and, go and, and here wipe we go. His damn <laughs> no I'm not letting that go I well, no I said here we go I know you that, that was that was listen a, and I've, I've always been the biggest Kyrie fan. That's the one time I was pissed off with Kyrie yeah. about doing – because there was no need to do that. Do you, do you remember Do you remember when T.O. went to the star? And yeah, I do. That's I, do. I, I when, didn't like him for that either. That's what I feel like. <laughs> People, when, like, they, they talked about him – I'm not I'm not supporting what he did at all because, you know, like I have a level of respect for Boston and feel like a care that they showed me. But at the same time, like that's that level of like, you guys want to treat me this way? All right, then we'll do this. We're going to compete. And when we beat you, I'm going to like put my flag, stamp my flag like Oklahoma, Texas game, put my flag in the middle of your, in my, in the middle of your stadium because like you guys didn't want me or you guys talk crazy about me. I'm going to show you different. Everybody yeah, see, Max, see, Max, see, Max takes it as a as a stop to the organization. He, I, I take it as he was stopping to the to the fans. But yeah, I took it as stopping to the fans. Like y'all, yeah. talk, y'all want to keep talking, calling me this, calling me that. Like, all right, bet. Yeah. Okay. Wipe right. my foot when I just beat you guys walking in your arena. Right. Ooh, ooh. That Thank seemed more. That seemed like more like dog like dog shit was on your foot, and you just wiped it. I was like, <laughs> yeah, he wiped it in there. He mean, wiped it in there. Come on, man. I was like, <laughs> I love you, dude, but that was. And and then that and that made everything else go. But and, and I've always. But then he goes from that to Brooklyn. He, he he's in Brooklyn, obviously, and he was loved there. And then all of a sudden he wanted to leave, and now he gets to Dallas. And I'm I'm I'm, I'm genuinely happy for Kyrie Irving. It seems like he's in a great place right now, and and I'm happy for him as a person and a person that you've been around and a person that I've always said maybe the best finisher I've ever seen before. Oh, right. I've, I've never seen that before. I said the most talented guard the Celtics have ever had offensively would have been Kyrie Irving. And I look at the league, he might be one of the most special guards like that. That left-handed shot that he shot against, uh, you know, that was crazy to, that he was able to make over the Joker. So he just has so many tools, man. So many, so many irons. It's crazy. It's crazy because, like, I was fortunate to be able to play those guys a couple times, like one on one and stuff like that during this during the year. And guarding Kyrie, sometimes I used to talk trash because I was like, I guard you pretty well. And then uh, we get to one on one and stuff like that. And the shots that he's able to create for himself and the separation he's able to create, like that's something I always say is special about him because he's not the most athletic or oversized guy, but like his ability to use his footwork, his positioning, how to stop on a dime, how to use either hand, like it's just special. And then Luca, his size and his ability to just create space, like it's two separate different players. And I, honestly, it's just, it's just really cool to play with and against. The man's a crane when I watch Luca. He just, and I understand what you're saying. Because I remember being, I was one of the first guards, one of the guys to guard Larry Bird. And I was thinking the same way. I'm like, this shit, no, nah, this this ain't real. This, And I stood out there for about, great. You about, remember, it was the early 80s. about the early an 80s. hour. After about an hour of play, I had not, I had pretty much talked about this white boy saying, shh, white boy can't play. After about an hour and getting to the next black person I got to after that practice, I said, you know what? 
fucking white guy can play down there and just change the narrative to who he was. And I'm sure that, but I'm just like, I'm very curious in how it was viewing Luca from afar, but then viewing him every day. That's a different feel for anybody. Yeah, I was on the South Garden. Him, and I was like, he makes a lot of tough shots. You know, like, I remember I talked to him when I got there and I said, um, like, did you ever feel like I guarded you well? You know, like, because, like, there was some times where, like, I would get good, great defense and he'd make a tough shot. He's like, yeah, you all right. Like, he would te- he's just that type of guy. Like, he's just like, he's an asshole sometimes. It's funny, but <laughs> at the same time, like, it's really cool because, like, when you get there, you realize that he does work on all these things. Like, he has, like, a love for the game and a level of commitment to it. And, like, it's all about, like, he just really – He worked with me. He works on this game. He threw it off the backboard one time, and it went in. I did, I've never seen that. The big the big jumbotron in somebody's building, he throws it up to the top, hits the, hits the jumbotron, and then comes straight in. He works on that? He works on everything you can think of. Like that, that, that shot that he shot, I remember the, there was a game where we were, it was a 28 foot mark. I was, I remember I was, I think I saw, got subbed out. And he was on a 28 foot mark. He bumps and like is in a trap location. He just throws it up with his right and it goes off the glass and goes in. Like he does, like he does that every single day. Like he'll, he'll walk into the gym and there'll be a ball rack there. He'll just start from wherever the ball rack location is and then he'll make like three or four of them and he'll be like, all right, cool. Like I kind of have the, have the feel like it's just he just special man he's special what was the biggest difference between playing for Ime Udoka and playing for Joe Missoula because that turnaround from the 2022 team man like we'll 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 never forget that you know just the way that you guys ended the season went right in through the playoffs all the way to the NBA finals two wins away and then all of a sudden you guys have a new coach heading into training camp you you have to ad- adapt to that. Just tell me, like, what was the biggest differences that you could think of off the top between uh, playing for Joe Mazzula in that first season and compared to what um, Ime Udoka was like? Two different styles. Um, I think, I think honestly, polar, polar opposite styles. You know, like, Ime is very, like, tough. I want dog. Like, and I want to defend. Like, offense will come. Like, I just want guys who are willing to play as hard as possible and fight and whatever else and grit. And then Joe's a little bit more like he still is like he's if you know him he's crazy as hell he he's, he wants to fight and tough he still wants that but he's way more offensively minded he's way more like I want to get better pace he want to get better looks like don't turn that open shots like even the contestant ones don't turn them down mm-hmm. and like that's where I feel like I think that it was it wasn't I always say like you have to give credit to Joe because like the first year of a head coach put in the position that he's he was in that's difficult for anybody like you're trying to both keep what was working going while also like putting your own twist on things. And I think that's probably a good, good thing, not a good thing, but like at the same time, like I think that it was something that was needed to happen for like myself, like to, for Sam to play. Cause that fits more Joe style versus when it was me and him, it's like a question of like, well, Grant got us help us get there last year. But then it's like, Sam is kind of fitting the kind of system and play that I want to play. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, I think that it's just two different styles of coaches. And we, we see that across the league, like when uh, like a cliff or like these guys have their tibs, these guys have their type of styles of teams, you know, they know the type of athlete, the type of person they want in their system versus like Joe was kind of handed a team. And that's why I think that this year's team has so much success, not just in addition with the Drew ad and the Kristaps ad, but like the the styles of play, like Ime in, in Houston, like he changed that team around because at the end of the day, he brought toughness and he brought grit to an organization that hadn't necessarily had a level of consistency or style of play. And I think that like both are tremendous coaches are just completely different. Like it's like arguing um, like a Rick Barnes to uh, uh, Nate Oates. Like Rick Barnes mm-hmm. is a little bit more old school, a little bit more physical, a little bit more down. Like I want to make the game muck and ugly. While Nate Oates is like, I want to play more fast. I want to shoot more threes. I want to play more NBA style. Like it's just sure. two great coaches. And once they get their teams, they can make the best, best, uh, maximize the potential of it. Playoff time, there is nothing like it. I mean, the energy, the effort amps up a good 50 to 75% compared to the regular season. And that's why you want to go to game time. The authorized ticket marketplace of the NBA. Now, they make getting playoff tickets even faster and easier. And here's the deal with the Game Time app. The prices of those tickets go down the closer you get to tip-off. They've got killer last-minute deals, all in prices, and you can also get the view from your seats with the lowest price guaranteed. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets. 
So here's what you should do. You you download the Game Time app and you browse it, and you can see that you can get Celtics and Bruins playoff tickets for less than hundred and fifty dollars. And again, the closer to Game Time you get, the lower the ticket price is. These are terrific deals for big time postseason games. Last minute deals. Save up to sixty percent off buying last minute sports, concert, comedy, theater tickets. Uh, all in pricing. Toggling this feature shows that. The total up front with no surprise fees at checkouts and also the lowest price guarantee or game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticket industry. So take the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets at game time. Download the game time app, create an account, use the code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code CLNS and get $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. Let me ask you this because, you know, everybody kind of wanted to know when the whole thing happened with Ime and the controversy he had leaving with the Boston Celtics. As a player, one, I know you had to be surprised, but did you guys finally get an understanding? Because that just had to be shocking. It was shocking to me when they just called me overnight saying, uh, emails out. Emails out? What do you mean, emails out? Yeah, there's, I feel like there's more to say, but I can't, we're not going to say. But um, I would say that Grant's not talking. Is that what you're saying? And Grant's not, Grant is holding something. Joe Sway, hold on a minute. I guess Lace the word, back. I Lace know. Works. Plus, Max, we didn't we didn't tell him, man. We we keep it on a hundred here. We should have put yeah, a disclaimer. We keep it on here. the hundred. We keep yeah, that's what 100. we do here. Lace Lace the worst was right about something. He called me the mayor back in the day. Um, so you know, I'm making this the right answer. Uh, I would say that I was definitely shocked because you know, but you have to understand the organization's position. Um, so, you know, I was definitely like bummed and frustrated and, and didn't want him to leave and a bunch of other different emotions. But at the same time, you know, you try to understand from the organizational perspective and business side of why it had to happen. And, you know, we all have our understanding of the story and kind of things that were happening and blah, blah, blah. And um, I always just say, like, I'm supportive of, of my man because uh, he he's one of the best coaches in this league. The, the, this dude is the best, Joe Sway. Great human. He, this is the first time yeah, I've good, heard man. He's got a future this in politics. I've ever heard him future. blah, blah, blah. This doesn't, doesn't connect. <laughs> we, this, pick, pick that. That's not a communicator, Grant. You, you know, that, that's the seven things your mom told you. Blah, blah, blah. What the hell is that? <laughs> that's <laughs> Simpsons. I mean, really. That was, that was option D. That was option okay, D. At the, okay, that, okay. That, that group chat must have been crazy. <laughs> I'll just say that, I'm sure. <laughs> Between you and the uh, the your, your, your teammates, man. Because, yeah, it was crazy. Crazy we, 48 hours, for sure. It was a crazy 48 hours. And it's funny because, like, it's, it's cool because I just, me and Joe had just got him back from Europe because I took Joe to Europe because um, I wanted to work with him that year. And then all of a sudden, all this stuff happens. You're working with the head coach. That's crazy. And it turned out to be the head coach. But then mm-hmm. you, that's why I was so, like, that's why it was so difficult at the time because, like, I was going through the whole contract and also playing well. And then all of a sudden, stopped playing. It was just a, a weird thing. We talked in Boston. Um, me and Joe, after everything that settled, all the dust settled, and after I was um, de- uh, Charlotte and stuff like that, and like he's always been my family, so like that's something that I was gr- great, great, and refreshing to like be able to have your brother back, because like people always were wondering like what's wrong with you and Joe, what's wrong with this, what's wrong with that, and it's cool to be able to say like we're good and moving forward, and like I'm supportive, I've always been supportive of him, but now we're back to where we were. It is, um, it is the NBA is in a great place right now. But I'm just trying to feel as a player, did you get an understanding or did you get the memo how the rules were just changed after the All-Star break? Because the game was completely <laughs> called different. I'm like, a foul, which was a foul, wasn't a foul. And then it foul. was, it's drastic, honestly. Like, it's normally like there's going to be some changes. Like, every year you're going to have it where you like, I remember last year, you'd be like, oh, it's a little bit more physical, you know, or they're letting things go a little bit more. Like, that's why people always wonder, like, Grant, why are you always weird during the season foul so much and stuff like that? And then, like, when the end of the season slash playoffs happen, you're like, oh, he doesn't foul at all. 
<laughs> yeah, because like late in the season, like they, they stop calling the fouls that are like the tic tac, yeah. the flails that the guys do to get their point averages and stuff like that. But right. um, this year was re- like aggressively changed, ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, like, watching the playoffs right now, I'm like, I've played in playoff series, and this year's completely like way more physical, and I would have loved it. Like, mm-hmm. like it's something that like. I wish they were able to do this over 82 games and over the course of like the whole season. But I do understand like player health, player safety. Cause like, if you did this over hundred and plus games, like you might have a lot more injuries than, than needed, but like uh, they definitely, I don't know if it was a memo to a referee saying y'all need to, you know, tighten up or if y'all need to do something, but um, they definitely changed their, like even the, some of the challenges that will happen during this, during the playoffs. Now you watch them and you're like, yeah, like that's technically like, that would be a foul. In the regular season, that would be a foul. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden, they're like, yeah, it was incidental contact. I'm like, <laughs> shit. <laughs> it's all the same thing during the season. Then. Like, I always laugh because I'm like, and then, like, I understand there's going to be selective officiating sometimes. Like, you can't throw a beat out for the flagrant foul he had on Mitchell, Mitchell Robinson. But let me do that. I'm out of there. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, certain things, I'm just like, all right, like, you got to understand there's going to be some, some, there's going to be some gray area. But the black and white is is a little bit more gray now than ever before. I think in, in this this whole playoff series and everything, and regular season. But that Joel and B thing, that to me was it, that was pretty bad. I mean, <laughs> he he just reached out and grabbed the guy's leg and yanked him back. I, I that's like. <laughs> <laughs> what part of the game is that? Yeah. Man, man, <laughs> Russell Westbrook got a flagrant for slapping a guy in the face and stuff like that. Like, oh, yeah, I, like what flagrant? That's a, like, I remember during the season, during, this is a sore subject, but uh, I remember Brandon Miller took one dribble and put his arm out a little bit too high and got contact with the guy. I was like, oh, it's going to be a flagrant one. Flagrant two. I'm like, oh. wow. So I'm just like, all right, let me just compare these to the playoffs that I'm watching. I'll watch some of the plays. I'm like, ooh, okay, we're going to keep these ga- <laughs> keep these games fun. Like, these, these guys are going to get thrown out. Like, I think as a fan of the sport, like, it's good. Like, if I'm – like, if I'm you, Max, if I'm old – like, if I'm even, like, the old school, like, 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s players watching this game, you're like, oh, this is this is the basketball I want to see. Like, we had scores in the 90 to – 96 to 80 in the playoffs. Like, that's that's fun in my eyes because it's not just the defense is allowed to play more, but we're not giving the like, Oh, I just flailed and I'm getting the call. Like, it's like, Oh, we're going to have to compete for every basket, every bucket. And there's going to be some tough shots being made. And there's also going to be some different schemes that have to be done. So I enjoy it. Here's one of the things that happened to you. And I'd like for you to tell the fans a little bit about it. Getting traded in the middle of the season, it's different when you get traded during the off season, but in the middle of the season, it's a little bit more upsetting or is it just dramatic? What what would you say? Um, it depends. So like if it was blind, I definitely would have been a little bit more like like what the heck, like more frustrated, stuff like that. Um the benefit is that like me and Nico have a great relation or good relationship and uh, we were able to communicate. He's a very honest GM or tries to be um with anything that's potentially like possible. Um and I remember I was communicating through the whole process because I had an idea and um, I remember it was going to, I knew it was going to happen. So like, it was more difficult more so when you get there and like trying to adapt, figure out where to live. Like that's something that people don't understand because like I was in a hotel for three and a half months. So like living out of the bags, I never went back to Dallas. So like I had to have my mom or friends or family kind of go back and like ship bags or like whether it was like fly out with them, be like, hey, I need some clothes to wear because otherwise you just kind of live, you're living out of bags for the next. But, but you know, well, look, it had to be a lot easier going to Charlotte, though. I mean, a lot easier because of, you know, you. Home. Yeah, <laughs> yes and no, man. Not everyone wants to go home. I say, you're, you're, you, you, you want. Why did you never come back and play it? Oh, well, why did you come back and play in Charlotte, Max? I was done by then, bro. I, I didn't have nothing to give. I was my. You wasn't trying to do that, man. I, I was done playing. If no, been, no, you could have. You could have had three more years. You know, say you had three more. Yeah, years let's say hypothetically, right? And you're like, you know what? I'm gonna play in Charlotte. I would have. I would have. I would have loved Charlotte. I would have at, at 25, when you right when you were uh, when you were playing, trying to you know be be develop your career. Probably not. Okay, <laughs> but. 
But he want me to keep. He want me to keep it on the hundred. Probably keep it on hundred. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Something I will say that surprised me was that like how much I would love it. Like I got here at first, I was kind of nervous because I was like, I'm gonna be surrounded by all these people I grew up with, and as much as they love and care, but like you're always gonna get called, you're gonna get hit up, and like you're gonna have to balance stuff like that. But it's something special about playing for your hometown team, and also special with if your hometown team is trying to build something and be you can be a part of it. That's something that I think I, I'm taking pride in because. Like, I remember I grew up with the Hornets. I grew up with the Bobcats. And, like, the fact is we haven't had the success that necessarily a franchise would want in this NBA and the league. So if you're a part of that team or if you're a part of that group that can hopefully spur those next 30, 20, 30, 50 years, like, I would love to be a part of that and lay the foundation and set it for the future. And, and was, was Jordan – let me ask you this. Was Jordan around at all or uh, was he on, hands-on? Was he out of there by the time you got there? He um he's still I think he's still a minority owner. Um he sh- she just shot me a text just because I'm a Jordan athlete and also mm-hmm. because I, I knew him before. So I was thankful that you know he reached out to me. It was like you know excited mm-hmm. to have him, blah, blah blah. But um he, I think he's a little more hands off now. You know Rick Schnall and Gabe Plotkin are the the governors and they're incredible. They want to. I'm my- gonna tell your mom if you ever use that blah 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 again talking, she's gonna be in your ass. Okay, <laughs> you know Grant, that is not how you communicate. That'd be like you, uh, you know. How, and I, you're a communicator. I've seen you before on air, and it's just funny when you think about how you how you play and what you do, man. I I love it, but. For you to communicate like that, that's kind of crazy to me. That's true. I was about to say, I just didn't want to, you know, I don't remember the whole text word for word, so I just don't want to I want to say, like, misquote what he said. But uh, what I will say is that the, the new ownership really cares, wants to invest in the franchise, um, both from a, an investment in terms of, like, the, the facilities, but also really want to make it an organization that can compete with these historic and competitive teams that have been over the course of these past 15, 20 years in the NBA. So um, I'm excited for the potential here and the growth here because not only does the ownership want really to happen, but I think the city does. And I think that as we continue to grow, like there's something that we can uh, make really special and make happen. And I think that's going to be sooner than people think. What was coming back to ED Garden like? Because like you said, well, I don't know if we, I think we talked about it before we started recording, but you're, you're still keeping contact with a lot of your you know, former teammates, you know, first time going into the visitor locker room. And second part of my question is, were you surprised by the by the tribute video or the length of it, rather? Um, just the, the whole experience, what was it like? Well, I didn't get a tribute video. I was, I was like, dang, I was like, I don't, I don't get no exactly. Luck. But, See, that exactly. was that was the controversy. I mean, after the fact, we we didn't even know if we should actually call it a tribute video or a salute video because I have listen, Max and I, we've been going to these Thank games for okay, years exactly. and years. I've never seen it done like that. I was expecting them to show those threes you knocked down in the corner. Game we, seven, everybody right. like. Well, what's this Grant thing like? Uh, hey, Grant, thanks for coming. And, and I think I, I'll give, I'll, I always try to, you know, play devil's advocate or look from the other side. But um, I think it's because when Rob told them he wanted just to uh, salute, like, thank you and stuff like that, they just yeah. – because they gave Smart the video. And I got to respect it. You know, Smart was there for eight years and was a true impact on the city and organization and everything else. And um, as much as I, you know, was involved in the community and loved Boston and the organization, you know, I think they just were trying to be consistent with what they had done prior. But um, was I a little bit disappointed? Yeah, just because I feel like um, there were some great years in those four years that I was there. I was a kid that got drafted there and I was a kid yeah. that. You know, grew up there and was able to, you know, hopefully go through a lot of things that help 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 them get to the point where they are now. But um, I was thankful just because, you know, even even if it's a slow dedication, no matter how small, you know, you got to be grat- have some gratitude because um, they could have just not done anything. So um, but even though it was just a thank you grant, you know, that's something that is, can be standard across the league, you know, but it definitely kind of surprised me. Um, normally tw- knowing twists and all the guys that are there, I would assume that they would have wanted to, but my guess is whether it was organizationally or something, they were just trying to be respectful of the people that just came, whether it was Malcolm or Rob. Yeah, no question. It was good to see you back, man, because obviously when you push teams, it kind of pushed things back, and the, I just know the fans were excited. I saw a handful of uh, 
your jerseys in the crowd. And, and it's, it's always cool because that's sort of the Celtics tradition, Celtics culture. Like people will remember you forever. And especially uh, when you come up big in the playoffs, you know, that, that huge game seven performance. Um, and, and of course, the team that went to the finals. And like you said, a team that, that drafted you and you started your career here. So. Yeah, and then in regards to, like, coming back as a visitor, yeah, it was definitely weird just because, like, I was like, oh, yeah, I remember walking this tunnel, riding that bus backwards up the tunnel. You're like, I love this. And then, like, walking into the visitor side, it's really really nice. I've never been over there, but it was was pretty nice. Um, But I remember, like, I didn't go on the court before the game, but I, I remember coming out and there was nothing but love, like, in the arena, like, people saying, come back, like, we'll want you back, like, and stuff like that. And um, and you, they were like, you'd be the next Al, we, we, we trade you, and then you come back two years later. And it was just, or, or Tice, I remember they said, we'll have Tice back for a third yeah, time. Yeah, Tice is the same, that's right. So yeah, yeah. It felt refreshing, you know, because, you know, when you're playing there, um, you're going to have to make some emotion, no matter where you're playing. But, like, the fact is, like, the true fans, the ones that show up every single night that are supportive of the team, like, it felt cool to be able to come back, see the jerseys, see the love that was being poured. And it, it feels cool to be able to say that, you know, you made an impact someplace, no matter if it was small or large. Well, Dad, dude, we want to thank you for coming on with us, man. And, you know, just giving you some – that I'm, I'm pissed off that it's 86 degrees right now in Charlotte and me and Joe Sway are dealing in the 50s here. You know, but, nothing uh, about yeah. spring. I mean, we got clear skies every yeah. now and then, but the weather, man, Grant's yeah. not it, man. It's the classic <laughs> the classic. you can wear a sweater <laughs> – and, but you know you're gonna be hot during the day, but at night you're gonna need that sweater again. You know. I've that, retired my uh, Canada Goose and. Uh, oh, you know, see, you don't need that anymore. Listen, <laughs> listen, y'all have fun because I'm sitting pretty 90 degree weather, golfing in the morning, even during the winters. You know, you might get a little cold, yeah. put a jacket on, but like I got a chance to be able to say, like, oh, the only thing that I could say that Boston doesn't have that we have it down here is just, it's the pollen and the, you know all that stuff. You know, the allergies, mm-hmm. seasonal allergies. But other than that, oh y'all have it. Y'all have fun. I can see, I can see the sun in November. Y'all can have y'all can have the gloomy skies all you want. I'm gonna be smiling. Pretty. Thank you, Grant. I hold on, hold on, hold on, Grant. Rip, watch, rip, watch this, Joe Sway. Watch this. Blah 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 blah. blah. <laughs> I want a prediction. How's this playoffs gonna end? Real quick. It's, it's been a crazy first round. Can I can I can put con- con- contingencies? Yeah, I mean, you do whatever you want to keep, keep it right, hundred, man. You you're gonna offend us. So I will have Celtics, and so it's either going to be it's going to be Celtics Nuggets, and I think that if the Celtics play the Nuggets, the Nuggets win by like it's like a seven game series or six game series, and the Nuggets mm-hmm. find a way to win. If the Nuggets lose to the Timberwolves, I have the Mavs going to the finals, Celtics Mavs, and I have Celtics beating the Mavs in probably six games. Wow. Okay. Okay. All right. Like but I think it's right. all contingent on if the Minnesota beats Denver. Because if Minnesota beats Denver, I think that I think Denver is the hardest team for Celtics to match up against, and just because Jokic is that special of a player and his ability to you know play and get guys involved. Oh, that, is that why you wore that Batman thing that time, the Batman suit? Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> when you stopped, when you stopped Jokic that time, and he came back and it rained. Terrible. Oh, listen, listen. Ever since that day, listen, Max. Listen, ever since that day, anytime I play the Nuggets, he been on my ass. <laughs> 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 he remembered. That's why he remembered on my ass. But listen, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Oh man! Before, before before we go, one last question I want to ask: uh, watching the watching um, Anthony uh, grow, Anthony Edwards. Is, is he is he is is he that dude now? Is he that one? <laughs> I think that he is still going to continue to grow, but he's a mother. He's that motherfucker. Like he's, 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 he's that motherfucker. Like he's a guy that you can look at where you're like, hmm. like if they keep that team together, he's a threat year over year. But like, yes. Bro, yes. it's a matter of like, do they have it this year? Because like adding that gauntlet to the West, just because you're you're the man this year, doesn't mean that John that might come next year. Doesn't mean that uh, Luca and them aren't going to improve. Like it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see who takes that mantle of that guy because I think it's between JT, Luca, and Ant um, because Giannis and those guys are towards their like prime and stuff like that. They'll be in, they'll be towards KD's time versus these mm-hmm. guys, new young guys. And then eventually after that, that's going to be Chet and Wimby and whoever else comes, Cooper, if he's that good. You better, you better, you better not leave Shea out of there. You better not leave so, Shea. This is what I'll say about Shea. Shea's he'll, be, he'll always be the underappreciated assassin. 
Wow. He'll be that guy. He'll be that guy that they're going to be like, he's going to be top five in the conversation and stuff like yeah. that. But like, they'll never give him the love. But I think that he's going to be that underrated assassin that's going to like always be a person that you're like, you know what? He deserves more credit. He deserves more credit. But right. people, he's in OKC. They're not going to talk about him as much as they, they probably should. But um, he's that underrated assassin that you're like, he might be in that James conversation where they're like, he's the best guard in the league. They might not say mm-hmm. he's the best. Either way, the NBA is in good hands, man. I, I, I can't wait to see all these careers unfold for sure. But uh, he is veteran forward from the Charlotte Hornets. He is Grant Williams on the Frederick Maxwell podcast. Don't be a stranger, man. We have to have you back on, man. This Anytime. You know I'm good to talk. <laughs> That's right. All right. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> That's going to do it for this episode of the Cedric Maxwell podcast. You already know. Uh, rate, review, subscribe, all that good stuff. He is Cedric Maxwell. I am Josue Pavone. We'll see you guys next week. Josue Pavone here, CLNS Media. And if you made it this far, that means you really like this video. So hit subscribe. Make sure you keep our notifications on, damn it. And we got plenty of uh, great content coming your way.